and I, I feel really it's a proud privilege to be uh, here in this afternoon and particularly to, to share a session which is going to be actually handled by uh, Majid Saab, who is supposed to be one of the luminaries in Islamic banking in this country. Uh, I request Majid Saab to probably make his presentation for about half an hour, followed by a brief discussion for about 15 minutes. Thank you so much. Honorable Chairman of the session, Professor Sudhakar, and my colleague on the days, respected ladies and gentlemen, I deem it a pleasure and a privilege to be here with this pioneer university in Urdu to address a seminar on a very relevant topic of a global financial crisis. And I have been requested by the organizers to restrict myself to only half an hour. And uh, it's a challenge to squeeze my contents into a half an hour session as it's a PowerPoint presentation. And uh, if I have any grievance of not being content with what I have said, I leave it to the session chairman to handle it. And for that, I think we may have to restrict our question and answer sessions to a very small time. So I'll be passing over the screens very fast. I request all of you to be with me during this brief session and enjoy what I present. I hope you are with me, is it? Yes. And instigated to go in for an innova. And that is where the whole consumerism industry fell flat on the ground leading to the crisis. Now, build up of a huge superstructure of credit. Credit is the mother of all evils. Credit creates a feeling that everything in the financial sector is OK, whereas there is some strict and underlying ailment in the system that is diagnosed only later on when the system starts to collapse. Now, lack of uniform and balanced distribution of the basic collapse began with the American subprime mortgage crisis. It was where houses worth $1,000 were financed for $15,000 and the person could not pay back. There were foreclosures leading to seizures. When houses were seized, the owner of the house did not even effort to hire a truck to take his belongings to another shelter apart from his house. And that is where the creation of a super superstructure, anomalous interest rate mechanism. The whole economy in the world rotates around an interest structure what we call in India and everywhere as a bank rate. Around the bank rate, all the banks have their own interest structure that is dependent on the sector which you are going to finance for credit. If it is for housing, for consumer loan, for any other structure, there is an interest rate structure that dominates the entire financing activity and that is one of the reasons for this collapse. Now, imprudent lending to submortgage, subprime mortgage sector, even in India, Many banks like HDFC Bank and ICIC Bank have been lending people solely against the guarantee of collateral and primary mortgage of houses. Now, when the economy collapses, there are no buyers either for principal security or for collateral security. And in such a case, even if you see somebody's house and drive him out into a houseless world, you will not get that back enough money to clear his loan. That is what the American financial sector is now facing after the foreclosures of subprime mortgage crisis. Then, non-identification of toxic assets on balance sheets in time. If Satyam was manipulating the balance sheet for the last so many years, it was never imagined that he would do it, and they could not identify the toxic assets on the balance sheets. Had that been done in time in America, when the main Lehman Brothers collapsed, and when Frankie Madden, Frankie Madden collapsed, when the three other major investment houses collapsed, including Merrill Lynch, they were able to find out that most of the assets on the balance sheet were tampered assets. They were known as toxic assets, which could not be identified in time. That was one of the reasons for that. And short selling and indiscriminate indulgence in derivatives. That's what we have talked about in the morning. Derivatives are speculative investments. That is selling and reselling an asset to more than 10 persons at a multiplied cost. And at, as per an estimate, there are $66 trillion derivatives in the world today that are in value more than 10 times of the world economy. So you can imagine where we stand today. Now, lack or total absence of an effective regulatory and control mechanism, and also transparency in operations. We have seen in most of the bank, including the Royal Bank of Scotland that collapsed in UK and many other banks, that there was no proper transparency in the board of management 
and in their account transactions. And the principles of corporate governance that were laid down by American and UK experts, they were the first to defy those principles of corporate governance and lack of transparency, which led to the collapse. Now, manifestation of the capitalist doctrine is the main reason. Now, what happens? I would like my young management students to give a little more attention to this. There is a doctrine that is called the capitalist doctrine. And that says, as long as a business venture or enterprise makes a profit, you privatize the profit. That goes into what Obama has said, the fat guys on the browsers, the fat guys on the Wall Street. As long as they make profits, they pocket all the profits. When they start incurring losses, they socialize the losses. That is how they bail out money. So they privatize the profits and they socialize the losses. Who enjoys the profit? The entrepreneur, the capitalist, the businessman. And who suffer the losses? The socialized man, the man in the street suffers the losses. So they privatize the profits and socialize the losses. That is the capitalist doctrine that has now failed very badly and miserably around the world. The collapse of financial sector institutions like commercial investment banks, insurance companies, and stock markets. No financial institutions has been able to insulate itself in this, in this crisis period. Not only investment banks, commercial banks, housing banks, investment companies, insurance companies like AIG Insurance have all collapsed because this monetary problem, this global financial crisis, has a cascading effect inherent in itself. If India is safe today, nobody can challenge and say it's going to be the same way by the end of 2009 because we are geographically away from the main targeted victims of the global financial crisis. It may take some time for the tsunami to reach the Indian shores, but they are bound to reach because we follow the same, we follow the same principle of interest-based transactions. Now, the cascading effect on world economy and global meltdown has got its own manifestation in all the economies of the developing as well as <coughs> underdeveloped countries. Now there's a huge drop in the gross domestic project, uh, gross domestic product of the G8 nations. The nations whose currency was known as hard currency, it was acceptable around the world. Suddenly the GDP has fallen down, not by a percent or two percent, but huge margins of 10 to 14 percent. And that fall in GDP will lead to a further economic crisis in those countries. And what was discussed by our earlier speaker, Mr. Jayesh Ranjan, that the far east, eastern economies of Singapore and Thailand, what they suffered two years back, they were able to recover. Their currencies are still much below par than other world economy currencies. Now, sister, the sectors worst affected have been automobiles, because General Motors and Fords have closed down in America. And Maruti is on the verge of further slashing down its prices because of no market. And the consumer goods industries, everywhere in the world has fallen, starting from ACs to any other consumer goods, including television and other items. The prices have now fallen so, so badly that the manufacturers have decided to cut down the manufacturing schedules to suit the market requirements. And services sector have been the worst hit, because as we have discussed in the morning, the BPO and the KPO sectors are basic financial sectors in the service sector industry, and they have been badly hit, the reason being all the global powers have been outsourcing the services sectors to developing countries. And China never outsourced anything to outside their own country, but US and UK have been outsourcing. Now when their economies are facing a meltdown, it is bound to affect all the BPO sectors around the world. Now, how does the Islamic financial sector is largely insulated from this crisis? That is a major question which I'm going to tell you now. The first is, Islamic investment strategy is based on ethical investment. That is, avoiding the prohibited instruments of three main elements. As there are many of our uh, friends who are learning through bilingual medium, Urdu medium, there are two things in the ethical understanding of the Urdu language. And that is, khauf e khuda and khauf e khanun. And the call for the current crisis is na khauf khuda raha na khauf khanun. And ethical investment means investment with khauf akhirat and khauf jaza. If you borrow rupee from somebody and do not return it back, as per the Islamic ethical standards, 
you are accountable on the day of judgment even for a rupee to the person to whom you have borrowed his money. And it is said that your soul will hang in a balance unless that rupee is settled by your successors. That is what the ethical investment strategy means in Islamic finance. Now there are three main elements which are awarded in all Islamic investments around the world. The first is riba. Riba is usury. I would not like to go into the details of the Quranic injunctions against riba, in what surahs riba has been mentioned, in what categories, how is it categorized as per Islamic fiqha norms of jurisprudence. That is not the subject of uh, the discussion here. The second is gharar. Gharar is a hazard of uncertainty and indulgence in intangible risk. When you take a risk, it has to be a tangible risk. You should be able to assess, if I do this, how much do I suffer by incurring this risk? If you jump into a pond of water full of whale, such poisonous weeds and other things, without knowing the risk that is involved, even if you lose a finger ring in the water, you don't mind because the risk of entering into that water is higher than the risk of what you have lost. That is known as tangible risk. Islamic investments always depend on tangible risk. If you indulge in intangible risk, you are always at a risk of losing whatever you have. Maisar is speculation, that is sattebazi. So first is riba, that is interest. Second is gharar, uncertainty of risk and intangible risk. Third is gharar. Gharar is maisar. Maisar is a speculative business in which there is a numbers game, a, a wage wagering contract, a staggers staggering game, in case I win, I win. If I lose, I lose everything. There's no logic to go behind that. And if you avoid this riba, gharar and maisar, the three Islamic instruments that are the ideal backbone of Islamic system, you will not fail in any economic order of the day. And then Islamic instrument investments are all participatory in nature and not lending based on interest. One has to understand this doctrine of Islamic finance. It is not based on lending of money on interest. It is based on participative methods of finance, that is ijara, that is a concept of leasing, where the lessee and the lesser have a stake and equal risk. The concept of musharika, that is the concept of murabaha, concept of mudaraba, ijara, istisna and salam. All the instruments of finance, the participant as well as the availer of finance have a risk to share. There is no activity without involving the risk. Whereas in conventional financial system, the entire risk and the burden of risk is dumped on the head of the borrower under whatever situation he is, he has to repay the money with the amount of interest due on his borrowing. In Islamic financial system, money is not a commodity to be lent for the price of interest. That is the basic concept because money has never been treated from pre-Islamic days as a commodity to be lent for the price of interest. If I lend a rupee to you today, I did not expect rupee and 50 percent tomorrow from you because the price of lending the money to you is not the interest I take from you. And that is again linked to the theory of interest of Professor J.M. Keynes, who has defined interest as it is the reward for parting with the liquidity of money. The longer the period you part with the liquidity of money, the higher the rate of interest. That is, if you keep an FD for three years, you get 10.5 percent because you are parting with the liquidity for three years. If you part with the liquidity for just three months, you get only 5.5% because the reward is lower in case of shorter period and higher in case of a longer period. That is the theory of interest based on the modern economics. Islam does not allow that. It says money is not a commodity to be lent for the price of interest. Now, observance of the classical doctrine of risk and reward, that is profit and loss sharing, that this risk and reward doctrine is understood, appreciated, by all the economists of the world. But they think it is a task of the medieval ages, what Islam has taught them, and this cannot be put into operation today. That is the misunderstanding. Because the risk and reward doctrine clearly says, no one is entitled to the reward of profit. I repeat, no one is entitled to the reward of profit until he is prepared to share the risk of loss. Do the banks share the risk of loss? Never. Did Merrill Lynch share the risk of loss? No. When they, want, when they advance a rupee, a dollar or a pound, they want their money back with their own amount of interest. They are not prepared to share any risk of loss. So Islam does not permit that. It says if you are prepared to share the risk of loss, then you are entitled to your reward of profit. If you do not, are not prepared to share the risk of loss, 
you are not entitled to have the reward of profit. That is the Islamic doctrine of risk and reward, profit and loss sharing. That is what is the cardinal principle of Islamic investment theory that is now being realized around the world. Observance of a high degree of prudence as an institution is a trustee of investment funds. Islamic banks are not institutions that are meant for lending. They are the trustees of investment fund. When I deposit $100 with an Islamic bank, the bank does not lend money to a third party as a borrower and charge interest on that. The contract of investment clearly states that you are prepared to share the risk of loss with the bank. The bank will invest your money as a trustee of your funds. Of whatever profit the bank makes, it will keep apart its share of management fee and the rest it will get distributed or shared with the depositor. That is where the whole thing gets different from a conventional instrument instrument to an Islamic finance instrument. Now norms for Islamic investments. Funds are accepted from investors only as investable deposits subject to the risk of loss under the profit and loss sharing norms. Even if you walk into an Islamic bank and tell him that you keep your money with me, don't give me any profit, the bank will not accept it because all the Islamic contracts known as Wad, Muwada and Muahada, three types of Islamic contracts, they all clearly spell out that only if you are prepared to share the risk of loss or the reward of profit, whatever is the ultimate result of the investment, you can keep the money with us, not otherwise. No bank in the world does this except an Islamic bank or an Islamic finance institution. And uh, I would like to, this Professor Sadakar would like to know that all the mutual funds, sir, are based on the principle of Mudaraba. That is, if a man invests under IPO, 10 rupees, and when the mutual fund opens in the market, it is listed and trading begins. If it opens at 14 rupees, the investor stands to gain. But if it opens at the par value of less than the par value at 9 rupees, who stands to lose? The investor, not the fund manager. This is what the Islamic finance system has been saying for the last 1400 years. But now it is being understood that the investor has to stand the risk of loss when he is prepared to have the reward of profit. That is what happens in the mutual fund and what is happening right now in mutual fund industry. Now, no assured returns are guaranteed by Islamic investments. If you go and keep your money in a bank, you are assured of 10.5% for a three-year investment period. Islamic banks, Islamic mutual fund do not accept, do not assure you any returns. They say all your returns are subject to market risk. When the mutual funds state that as an understatement at the end of the mutual fund offer document, nobody takes any observance of that. But when Islamic bank says that, people get scary. They think, oh, everything is now put to loss. We'll only get loss and no profit. It's not like that. They only make a precaution. A risk factor is highlighted stating all investments subject to profit and loss. And not that all investments are subject to risk of loss. Now, under Mudaraba contract, the fund manager of the Mudarib has got the right to invest the Rabul Mal's money, the owner of capital's money, into the business of what he is doing and share the profit he gains after deducting his fund management fees with the investor that is the Rabul Mal. But the Rabul Mal, the owner of capital, is bound to share all the losses in case the mutual fund gets a loss, not the fund manager. Now, what are the Sharia is investment avenues for Islamic investors? Now, with all this theory behind them, what are the avenues? Where can I invest? Only in a cycle taxi shop or an auto rickshaw or a bus? No. There are avenues for investment. And that is, first of them is, an investment should be Sharia compliant investment. And for the, to observe the Sharia compliance norms, there are screening norms, screening norms involving fiscal as well as financial norms. And Dow Jones Index, that is a worldwide index for all the investments, Dow Jones Islamic Index has got a set of index norms for screening of Sharia stocks, Sharia Islamic mutual funds, which states that the fiscal norms include non-investment in alcohol, pork, liquor business, speculative and vulgar display. These things are not the investment avenues for Islamic banks. In financial screening, they have got their own norms of interest income and investment borrowed on capital. Now, we have got the halal mutual funds, the Islamic mutual funds, which invest only in permitted equities of companies which are not involved in the business of pork and liquor and other associated items which are not permitted by Islam. And there is the Islamic bonds that are sukuk. Now, when there are conventional bonds, why Islamic bonds? 
Conventional bonds are merely words of promise made by the government in case they are sovereign bonds. If they are private bonds, it's only a word of promise. At the end of seven years, I'll pay you your 10,000 rupees along with 7.5% interest. You sleep over it for five, seven years, end of seven years, go to redeem your bond, get back your 10,000 plus 7.5 interest. Islamic bonds are not like that. Islamic bonds are bonds issued against a physical real security. And it's a revenue generating asset whose revenue is shared with the bondholder. And on redemption, you get back your money subject to the market price of the asset on which the bond has been issued. The difference between an Islamic bond sukuk and a conventional bond. And Islamic private equity. In every Islamic browse, there are companies which are not listed. And there are investors who are keen to invest their money in private equity, apart from listed equities. And the investors are making more money, more halal profit in equities that of private equity than of investing their monies in listed equities. Now we have a new field of study that is halal wealth management. When a, trillion, when a millionaire or a billionaire or a trillionaire has so much of fund, he does not know where to invest them, he approaches an Islamic investor advisor who advises him for Islamic wealth management. And that may be in companies as far as China and Hong Kong, which are fiscally and financially Sharia compliant for investment. And his wealth management is managed by Islamic financial advisor who invests his funds in, around the global investment market only on Sharia permitted norms. And the real recent in, uh, innovation in the financial sector is takaful, that is the Islamic insurance. It is a whole field in itself to be described. How an in conventional in insurance differs from an Islamic insurance? What is takaful? What risk does it cover? It's only conventional risk, a financial risk, or a total risk. And how does the insurer get back his amount? On what conditions the amount accepted? How are the premiums invested? What are the accruals to the premium? A totally different subject altogether, which goes into a dwelt in the long length of uh, discussion, not a subject of today's seminar. Now, critical, they say most Islamic banks, Islamic mutual fund, Islamic financial organizations are originating and operating from Northern Africa, that is the part of Muslim world, comprising of 58 countries. They do not have a base in other parts of the world. That has been disproved now because Many other countries, apart from the North African region, have shown that Islamic financial organizations have made, have made better and more consistent profits than conventional banks operating in their countries. Particularly Bruni, Hong Kong, and China have shown that. Now, the other aspect is Islamic financial institutions are not generally exposed to the risks the Western financial organizations faced. They feel that the Islamic financial organizations are being run by the money of the sheikhs. That is wrong. Any Islamic bank, Islamic mutual fund, or any Islamic financial institution for that matter has got a profile of investors starting from an employee wage earner, an expatriate from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and anybody in the world. They have got investment from all over the world, not only from those people who are having surplus liquidity with them, which they can launder the money anywhere in the world. What are the hopes and promise? Investors' undiluted faith what I've already tell you about Akhirat and Jawab Dehi. That is the most un undiluted faith in the ethical values based on the Holy Quran and the Sunnah and the fiqh that is the Islamic jurisprudence part of it. Cert certain, <coughs> certain aspects, the system is cleansed of all deceit, dishonest and greedy trading practices of which the West is now talking about in Davos. They have talked about greedy trading practices, indulging in speculative businesses, indulging in derivatives to the value of 10 times the world economy. And then investors are, investors are equal shareholders in all financial ventures and they participate in losses. They are equal stakeholders in all the investments. That's why they're also subject to losses. Now what the what equity-based norms will now succeed because lending-based, interest-based lending has now come to an end people will only want equity-based lending. Islamic financial sector is bound to grow at a phenomenal rate, not because of any religious reason, but because of reasons of feasibility, consistent profitability, and its growing geographical area in size of its operation. The future appears bright as evidence from progress in Islamic financial market issues of Sukuk, progressive growth of the sector, improved market share, 
in the conventional financial market, rapid growth of takaful Islamic insurance sector. Apart from that, investor confidence is strengthened and consolidated by continued and sustained performance of Islamic financial institutions. Steady growth of IFS despite global recession is a major factor why the confidence of non-Islamic investors also is getting strengthened in the system. Now why the West is inquisitive about why the Islamic financial system is able to insulate itself from the current global financial crisis. The first reason is the US Treasury Department has set up a special committee to study and find out the reasons why technically the Islamic financial system has been able to insulate itself from the global financial crisis. They only want universal laws as applicable to any other financial organization like the Islamic financial organization also. Second is the International Monetary Fund has called a committee for the same purpose. They are already in Saudi Arabia studying the basics of Islamic Development Bank and how this financial system has been able to insulate itself from the current global financial crisis. Attention of most Western bankers and governments and economists is now concentrating on the Islamic finance sector. Delegation of Islamic economists and bankers from West are visiting Saudi Arabia, Bahrain to study the strengths of the system. And Far Eastern countries like Hong Kong and Singapore are taking special interest by amending their existing laws to promote the Islamic financial system. That's a very healthy development. What are the highlights? Despite the global crisis, what else is happening in the Islamic world? Qatar Islamic Bank is going to issue $1 billion fund for Khatam Investment Authority. HSBC is the global market leader in Islamic finance. HSBC has come out openly and a market leader in Islamic finance reaffirm its commitment to Islamic finance globally. Islamic Development Bank Jiddah approves 25 billion operational plan for member countries adversely affected by the crisis. Islamic Bank of Thailand plans bump in corporate operations. CVB Sukuka Salam Securities Bahrain is oversubscribed. Dubai launches a new Sharia hedge fund index. Duce Bank launches revolutionary Sharia compliant issuance. And SO Malaysia is to sell 150 million ringgit Islamic commercial paper. This is despite the crisis. The Bank of Bahrain and Kuwait has launched a Kabinawa investment bank that is of $3 billion. Al Imna Bank nets $104 million in the first seven months of operations. And National Commercial Bank of Saudi Arabia has declared the best bank in Islamic finance in KSA, that is in competition against all the multinational conventional banks based in Saudi Arabia. Now we have recently had the WTA conference in Davos. What have the prophets of doom said there? All the prophets of doom gathered in Davos to discuss a few things. At the World Economic Forum, they prophesied gloom and collapse of world economic order. But their statement said, Islamic finance is a panacea for most evils as it, is, it, as it links credit expansion to the growth of real economy. This is the basic point where Islamic finance scores a point over <coughs> conventional economics. Because it is linked, the credit is linked to the growth of real economy. It is capable of minimizing the severity and frequency of financial crisis worldwide. And it provides credit at affordable rates to subprime borrowers instead of providing billions to rich banks to bail them out. This is a very important aspect that has to be studied. Now, these are the conclusions that need to, first is the credit Economy developed as a developed nation, developing nations has bloomed, not observed in the last 70 years. After the Great Depression of 1930 and 1935, the first time that the world economy is experiencing this gloom, now there is a need to revisit Bretton Woods. Bretton Woods Conference had laid out a new world economic order to be followed by all the countries in the world. And that is where the SDRs were first initiated and special drawing rights were drawn and drafted that was to alternately, to alternately be used against dollar. The special drawing rights are being used as a currency by the International Monetary Fund for all the companies, and that is heavily lopsided in favor of the G8 nations. So we, have, we need to revisit Bretton Woods to evolve a new world economic order, and that should be based on principles of ethics, 
equity and justice for all. Consider revising the standard, international gold standards for international monetary policy. Now, American policy for the last 30 years has been that the petroleum has to be bought only against dollar currency. If a poor country like India has to buy petroleum from Saudi Arabia, it has to be bought only through dollar payment. That has to go. They have to have a new currency now. This should be global in order to avoid this set of financial crisis in future again. Islamic finance experts should not be complacent. Instead, they should put in more efforts to develop better and widely acceptable Sharia-compliant global financial products. It's not a time to be complacent about, but they have to go in, put in their heads together, and find out and explore better and more viable avenues for investment. There is a need for experts, professionals, and academicians from various sectors to come together to evolve mutually acceptable strategies for world economic order in a modernized and new format. Focus should be on eliminating poverty and developing hitherto neglected sectors in order to achieve balanced growth of world economies. That is what is the need of the hour. Thank you so much. I thank the organizers, the Marana Azad University, the chairperson of our session, and the audience for being so patient to hear this discourse on Islamic finance.